What's up guys, Dalmata here, and today we're going to be reacting to another Yawn Side video. So this one we are doing part two of the game developers can't be trusted. Uh, so this one I believe is talking about microtransactions and pre-orders, because I think that's where we ended off in the last one, was I said he was going to talk about those, and then he said it would be in the part two video. Uh, so link to the original video down below, uh, and yeah, let's jump into it. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the second video in this series where I explain why we cannot trust game developers. If you haven't seen the first video, you should go and check it out. It's got a bunch of good information and kind of leads right into this one. It explains my thinking, some important points, and basically just gets you an overall refresher of why we're starting out where we are. But either way, now we're going to talk about microtransactions. And to do that, we're going to have to take it back. Way to a mystical time known as 2006. I, I think this is going to be about Oblivion. I think Oblivion is the first game where I remember it being controversial. Or really where I remember microtransactions even being a thing. Um, yeah, because before... The, like, you had expansion packs before that, but like they were basically full games, and that was kind of a PC-exclusive thing, right? Uh, you would have, like, a, like, you'd have, like, Warcraft 3, for example, then you'd have the Warcraft 3 expansion, which was the Frozen Throne... But it was the it was the same size as Warcraft Three. It was like an entire other game. It doubled the size of the game, so those weren't <clears throat> weren't really controversial. The first one I remember being controversial was the Oblivion Horse. I'm just, I think that might have been around 2006, when Chris Brown was still a chart topping, non Rihanna beating superstar. <laughs> Four Loco still had caffeine in it. We they don't the anymore. Greatest men this world has ever known. Wow, that was back then. And while we were too busy with one tragedy, none of us noticed that gaming had officially started on one of the most predatory and slippery slopes that we had ever seen in the industry. And it all started with something pretty harmless. Horse armor. A set of horse armor. Yep. In March of 2006, the RPG game Oblivion was released by gaming giant Bethesda. And only one month later in April, they decided to test the waters with some DLC that was purely cosmetic. A set of golden horse armor that was only $2.50. The funny thing is, some people were actually mad right off the get-go. They thought it was... Yeah, I remember this being a big controversy at the time. Especially because, I think people forget this, but um, Halo 3 had map packs. But the Halo 3 map packs were like 3 or $4 each. And you would get like, four. I think it was four maps per map pack. They had one that was free that came with two maps. And then they had three or four after that that came with three or four maps each. But they were only like three dollars. If you bought all the map packs, I think it was like twelve bucks, right? And it, it, it's funny because back then that was even seen as like semi-controversial because there were certain playlists you could only play if you had the map packs, and people were mad about that. Nowadays, like that, could you imagine only paying twelve dollars for I think it was like twelve or sixteen maps or something like that? Like now, that would be a, a fucking season pass now that would cost you a hundred bucks stupid and insignificant and priced too high for something that was just going to be purely cosmetic and didn't add anything to the game which is pretty hilarious that they thought it was priced too high because if you look at some in-game stores now there are some cosmetics and cosmetic bundles that cost as much as a full game yeah now i can't man the worst for this has got to be the new halo game like because halo the armor doesn't look that much different no matter what you do because because in order to fit into the halo universe you can't change it that much Right, the, the cat ears one is the one that I think, at least that I'm aware of, that looks the most different. I mean, I guess they also have the samurai armor, but you got that from uh, uh, an event, so it was actually free. Um, I don't know if they ever re-added Hayabusa. I haven't played Halo Infinite in a long time, but some of them are like $25, $30 in Halo. And it, it, like, it barely looks different. Your character barely looks different. I can't find the specific sales numbers for the Horse Armor DLC, but Todd Howard, the current and at the time of the game's release director of Bethesda, has come out and said that the Horse Armor DLC outperformed multiple other DLCs that they had put out for the same game. So clearly it didn't hurt their bottom line. Yeah, it's three bucks and that's price. I think it's also important to quick talk about the terms DLC and microtransactions. DLCs technically started in 1997 with a game called Total Annihilation by Cave Dog Studios. Instead of revamping or rehauling the game or putting out a whole other game, they would intermittently put out updates that would add things like new characters, map expansions, and new game modes just to keep the game fresh and exciting. And of course, this was a great idea because it retained a player base, so it led to various other games doing this for the foreseeable future, and eventually charging for it. 
While microtransactions are technically DLCs, they're differentiated in a few ways. First and foremost being that DLC is usually regarded as something that adds on to the base game. This could be new characters, new maps, plot extensions, or entire new storylines. Whereas microtransactions are something your six-year-old sibling will not stop stealing your mom's credit card for. <laughs> this motherfucker got 43, 49,000! I'm gonna fuck you up! Man, that's like $500 worth of V-Bucks. That is, oh, dude. That kid's in some shit. That kid is in some shit. Oof. But yeah, I think the biggest thing with microtransactions is it's usually in-game currency, so it's like pay-to-win buying power games. You know, like the kind of stereotype by mobile games. Uh, or, you know, in pay-to-play. The I don't even know what it's called. It's like um, the games where like you could technically play for free, but if you actually want to play the game for more than like 20 minutes a day, you have to pay. You know, you're like, you need gems to do this, and you only get 20 gems a day unless you buy this that gives you 100,000 gems and stuff like that. Um and then the other one is obviously just cosmetics. Generally, microtransactions don't add anything to the game. They're skins, battle passes, loot boxes that are basically bought just to show all the other players you have more money than them. This was, however, until a couple companies decided to take it a step further. While it was generally understood that microtransactions were just going to be purely for cosmetics, they quickly saw how much money they were raking in and came up with a genius strategy. Why don't we make game mechanic loot boxes, therefore making the game pay to win? Yep. Do you so, consider them ethical? So what we look at as, as surprise mechanics. Um, and this is extremely Surprise not mechanics. Only game, but also to player psychology. Loot boxes are extremely addictive and yep. have even been found as a form of illegal gambling that children have access to in countries such as the Netherlands, where they just full on outright yep. ban them. And it seems like a couple other countries are starting to follow suit. Yeah, I know some companies have actually moved away from this in an attempt to avoid uh, future possible lawsuits. They've already moved away from this. And I assume that over the next probably decade or so, most companies will. Um, but then you might see like a, a multi, you know, multiple systems where like certain countries allow it, so they use it there, but then other countries won't, so they won't use it there. Which then just kind of gives you like a regional advantage where, you know, if you live in this region, it's easier to get stuff, especially when they have pay-to-win systems. And then, you know, it's really going to hurt your uh, your audience in one area to the point where they might stop playing. So it might not be beneficial to do it regardless. And most people would agree it's for a pretty good reason. Young kids probably shouldn't have access to this type of monetary system. They don't necessarily understand the gravity of what they're doing or the actual implication of the money they're spending. Remember a minute ago when I said... Whereas microtransactions are something your six-year-old sibling will not stop stealing your mom's credit card for. That wasn't me making a joke. That actually happened. No. And there's basically 16, an unlimited 20, number of stories and almost three, nothing being oh my God. to regulate it. And one of the worst offenders and practically dubbed as the boogeyman of loot boxes is EA. The best example of this is their ultimate team on the FIFA franchise, where gamers get new and better players to build the strongest team that they possibly can. And the best way to get new and better players is by opening loot boxes. This means if I spend $1,000 versus someone who spends nothing, I can put together a much better team than them and practically shit stomp them until they cry. And of course, this is going to make them want a better team and ultimately buy more loot boxes. And because your team and players aren't transferable from one FIFA game to the next, this cycle happens every single year. Yeah, that's... But this strategy has backfired. When EA announced Star Wars Battlefront 2, you could hear gamers and Star Wars nerds across the globe celebrating, just popping open the nice vintage Mountain Dew and sucking on their finest menthol jewel pod. It <laughs> was until everyone figured out that to unlock certain players, you would have to spend hundreds of hours just to get them if you didn't want to outright yeah. buy them. But of course... Yeah, I remember uh, the controversy at the time, if I'm not mistaken, was... Uh, each character took, I think it was around 100 hours to unlock unless you paid for them. And the the, the guy at EA, the spokesperson, came out and said, oh, well, you, you know, you can unlock the characters. And somebody did the math on, like, how much you would have to play to unlock every character and or to unlock everything in the game if you didn't purchase it. It was somewhere around, like, 10,000 hours, which is like the equivalent of, like, working at three years at a full-time job. So it's like... 
you literally play this game as a full time job for the next three years, or you pay hundreds of dollars. It's up to you. Of course, no major company would do this to their bread and butter. They'd only do it to the smaller, more insignificant, cool one off characters, right? Not the ones people like specifically buy Star Wars games to play as, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> right? This led to an incredible amount of backlash, not only from major news outlets, but practically every corner of social media. In fact, it cemented itself in a little bit of internet history when EA responded to a post on the subreddit Battlefront 2. They claim they locked the characters so players would feel a sense of pride and accomplishment when they unlock their favorite heroes. And this ultimately became the most downvoted comment in Reddit history. <laughs> 700,000 downvotes. But hey, at least EA can feel a sense of pride and accomplishment in being number one. <laughs> and just to put that in perspective, the second most downvoted comment in Reddit history has about 89,000 downvotes, and it was from a guy asking to get downvoted. Ultimately, EA dropped the whole loot box thing after they saw their sales numbers fall, and it actually turned into a pretty good game with a sizable player base. Well, that's if you actually played it. I think a lot of people like myself were in the same boat of not wanting to buy it anymore, regardless of how excited we were just a few yeah. weeks prior, because of the... I, I still haven't played it, and uh, the original Battlefront games, I loved them. I had them on uh, PlayStation 2. I actually still might have them somewhere. Um, but I, I used to play the hell out of those. They, they were so good, such cool games. And yeah, I haven't, I, I have not played either of the new ones, just like on principle. Bullshit EA tried to pull. I mean, Although I say on principle, and then it, yet I play WoW. I'm, I still play WoW, even though it has microtransactions. I mean, it didn't sit right with us, and it ultimately ended up ruining the game and the experience for a lot of people. The bright side to all of this was it did show that there was a limit to how much shit people were willing to shovel before they bomb reviews, requested refunds, and just outright boycotted the game. Sadly, microtransactions do seem like they're here to stay, with the majority of games opting out of a traditional rank up and unlock system for some sort of battle pass, most games now having enough new cosmetics that everyone on the map can look different, and in-game currency like shark cards, Roblox, and V-Bucks being added to every 12-year-old's Christmas list. Yeah. And that's probably just how it's going to be from now on. And honestly... And I, I, we went to, to my grandma's birthday. Um, it would be like two weeks ago or so. And all my cousins on that side of the family... Uh, well, I have a couple that are older than me, but the, most of them, all the ones that were there at least, were like far younger than me because my dad's one of the older siblings. So they're all like, you know... 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, somewhere around there. And they found it. I, I played Fortnite, and they instantly started asking me how many V-Bucks I had. <laughs> like, how many V-Bucks do you have? How many skins do you have? It's not that bad, as long as it just sticks to cosmetics rather than a pay-to-win system. To me, the worst part about microtransactions is that it's slowly leading to the death of single-player and multiplayer campaign-driven games. Single and multiplayer campaign driven games are obviously a massive part of the gaming community and industry as a yep. whole. They used to be the biggest part of the industry. So clearly they're never going to fully die, but their prevalence is starting to diminish. I mean, let's look at some split screen campaign games. Some of the best of them came out almost a decade ago Halo 3, Borderlands 1 and 2, Portal 2, the Left 4 Dead series. Man, H Halo 3 is like the GOAT game. So good, but yeah, the, the Halo Infinite they they promised. Uh, I, I'm honestly surprised they haven't gotten like a class action lawsuit for false advertisement because when the game was coming out, they said approximately two months after the game's release, we'll have split screen, and then right around the time that it was supposed to be a thing, uh, they announced that they had dropped the adoption of split screen. There was going to be no split screen campaign. So I wonder how many people bought that thinking there was going to be split screen or wanting there to be split screen and then it not being a thing. Because I remember, like, I, I, I now I'm older, right? So I usually don't have friends over. We usually just play games online over Discord or whatever. But, like, when I was growing up, that was, like, the number one way you would play, right? You'd have your buddies come over and you would play split, split screen. Like my cousin, for example, we, we, we played rugby together. And went to the same high school. So we would go to school, have rugby practice. And any, any night that we had rugby practice, he would come over to my place. And we would play sp split screen Halo until like 9, 10 at night when his mom would come pick him up. And 
Yeah, like the, they honestly the biggest thing to me for there is that they shot themselves in the foot. Like I, I don't think these companies understand how necessary split screen is for like the for your game to become popular. I'm honestly surprised it took Fortnite so long to add it because I don't think they added it until the start of Chapter 3, I think. Um, and they, it's also trash. You, like, it, your character takes up half your screen for some reason. Like, not like your character as in, like, the, you know, the third-person shooter of the character that you're playing as. No, like, they just literally have, like, a your character, like, a picture of your character is right here and then down here for some reason. It's like they just take up a giant chunk of your screen. It's so stupid. Hell, Portal 2 is the second highest rated game on the Steam Marketplace, and it didn't even get a third installment. Well, why is that? The issue with single player and multiplayer campaign driven games that don't have an online mode is there's no money to be made on the back end of it. All your revenue is going to come from that initial purchase and maybe a DLC or two down the road. With online multiplayer at the level it is, there's so much more money to be made in selling a couple million people a battle pass every few months, especially for a game like Fortnite who's still going strong after four full years. Not to mention there's no need to buy overpriced skins when the only player- Man, the, the crazy thing is that I think this is, this was released two years ago, almost three years ago from when he put, put, and Fortnite is still going strong. Still one of the most popular shooters uh, on some days, it is the most popular shooter. Like it's uh, it's always in the top five, usually one or two. Who's going to see it is the player playing the game. I'm not trying to impress myself. I already know I'm trash. It was extremely nice to see a game like It Takes Two take home the 2021 Game of the Year award because it did still show that there's a market for this and people. I'd never even heard of this game. And which Game of the Year award? Because all these companies have Game of the Year awards. Who are willing to accept it and love it? Regardless, I think you would be hard-pressed to find anybody willing to disagree that these types of games are falling by the wayside while these massive multiplayer experiences are taking over. And it's mostly in part due to how we now pay for games. Now, I was actually going to end the video right around here, but something massive just happened that is a whole subject I was kind of going to stay away from, but now I feel the need to go into. So unless you're like my grandfather with dementia, you probably heard that Microsoft just acquired Activision Blizzard for an insane $68.7 billion. In the last decade, Microsoft has been on a spending spree that would put the US military to shame. They're practically collecting studios like Infinity Stones at this point. Compulsion, Mojang, Ninja Theory, Obsidian, Bethesda, and now Activation Blizzard, which practically has 10 studios to themselves. There's an absolutely abysmal number of small companies that aren't- I love how Ubisoft everything's just named Ubisoft. Ubisoft Toronto, Ubisoft Becker, uh, Bucharest, Ubisoft Berlin, Ubisoft Montreal, and the Microsoft, yeah, they got Blizzard, Activision, Take Two's got Rockstar, Rockstar North, 2K. I didn't realize there were so many Rockstars. Jesus Christ. Um, Embracer Group. I don't think I've ever heard of these guys. What do they own? They own, they own a bunch of stuff. Okay. EA. Tencent. Yeah, Tencent has a lot. Um, Sony. Yeah. So there's not a Nintendo on here, but I think Nintendo only owns Game Freak as like a subsidiary company. Owned or at least backed by one of these massive corporations. And honestly, I can't tell you if this is going to be a minor annoyance or a really bad thing. It might be nothing more than... Honestly, because of stuff like Steam and how easy it is to develop games, um, like obviously it's a lot of hard work, but how easy it is to like get them published if you, ha if you develop them, and how many indie, you know, how easy it is for indie companies to put out games. I honestly don't think it'll be a big issue. I think I think for certain franchises it may suck, right? One of these big companies buys up a franchise you like and just completely ruins it. We've seen that happen a lot. Um, so it will definitely ruin certain franchises, and that's going to suck if you're a big fan of a certain franchise. Um, you know, Halo probably being the one for me. Although, I mean, technically they're still owned by Microsoft, even though it's another studio. It's still Microsoft in the end. Uh, so, you know, they ruined their own baby there. But um, I, I, I think overall gaming will be fine. Individual franchises will definitely suffer, but overall gaming will be fine.
and just having to choose your next console based on which exclusive games you want to play. I mean, there are which not... a lot of us already do. Yeah, the only, literally just buy Nintendo because PlayStation almost every game comes out within a year. So if you're willing to wait a year, there's no point in buying a PlayStation. Xbox literally every game comes out on PC day one now. I can't I can't remember the last time they actually had an Xbox exclusive. Um, so you can get Xbox Day Ones on PC, so you just need a PC. PlayStation, if you're willing to wait a year, I think every game except for Gran Turismo comes to PC. So unless you're a hardcore Gran Turismo fan, then just buy a PC and wait a year. Nintendo's the only one you need. And even that, you could argue, you could emulate. Um, but yeah, like literally, if you, if you want to play every game, the only console you need is a Nintendo. On the darker side of things, it could lead to exactly what monopolies and oligopolies have been known for for the past century. Price fixing, stolen IP, high barriers to entry, market manipulation, or, something I've been harping on this entire video, lack of innovation. When you get into a marketplace that has very few contenders, there's a very strong lack of incentive to do anything new or groundbreaking. Because as I said earlier, why would you when you know what you've got is already going to sell? And now, Your Honor, I'd like to present Exhibit A. Nintendo. <laughs> Nintendo has always kind of been in their own lane, and for good reason. Being able to market your exclusive games on your exclusive... I mean, that's actually only really true recently. I, I, I guess it has been true for like the past... I shouldn't say recently, because it's really been true since like the PlayStation... Since Sega died, essentially, right? Before that, like, Sega was, like, a direct competitor. Like, back then it was, like, you know, the, they were very similar. Sega obviously tried to lean a little bit more to the edge, a lot more blood and games, stuff like that. But they were very similar. I think it started to differentiate once you had, like, the PlayStation 1 and especially the PlayStation 2 uh, and then the Xbox, right? They were, like, the, the serious, hardcore gamer consoles and Nintendo was for little kids. Which is one thing I've always found very ironic, because the people that play Nintendo are far more likely to be like your actual like hardcore gamer, like somebody that plays video games all the time, right? The people that play PlayStation Xbox are far more likely to be like your casual gaming fans. But the PlayStation Xbox, like I, I don't know if it was like a, they had like good marketing there. I don't even know if it was like. De I mean, it was somewhat dedicated marketing, but like the fact that they got labeled the hardcore systems to fight the, despite the fact that they're like the, the definition of casual systems. Although I, I guess you, Nintendo, you could argue super casual too, like with how many units the Wii sold and the Switch. And I mean, they're two of the most popular selling consoles of all time. So I guess more people own those. Lucid console with solid IP as your groundwork is unbeatable when it comes to profitability. Remember when I told you how many Mario games there were? Did you really need Mario in all of those games? Yes. I mean, did a kart racing game really need an Italian platforming plumber that's known for eating shrooms and stepping on turtles' heads as a protagonist? <laughs> did you really need Mario Kart's so good though. Simulator with the Italian stallion as their head. I mean, the yeah, the golf and I had Mario Golf 64 was kind of good, but yeah, the, a lot of the sports ones are kind of trash. But the fucking uh, Mario Kart's so damn good. Don't talk I, shit about Mario Kart. Of course not. But the IP is so solid that they use it for games that might have not done as well without it. But as long as people are still interested in it, they're going to keep pushing it out wherever they can with less and less work put into it every time. I mean, just look at the most recent couple generations of Pokemon to come out. I mean, come on. A fucking cup of tea and a sentient sword. And I Okay, this is like the dumbest argument ever. I see people make the, like, the, this is like the stereotypical Gen 1 argument. I think there's a lot of fair criticisms of Pokemon. The fact that like the franchise is essentially stagnated is a very fair criticism, right? They very little changes ever any game. Very fair criticism. Um, the the fact that the graphics are still atrocious, despite the fact like one of the things that like it, it, this may be hard for like modern Pokemon fans to understand, but Pokemon in like the '90s and the early 2000s were like cutting edge games, like they like. As far as handheld console games went, they were, like, the pinnacle of handheld console games for, like, graphics and size and scope and all this stuff. Which, it, it seems, like, laughable today, right? Because they, they fucking phone it in, like, every game. I think those are fair criticisms. Pokemon design, I mean, like, dude, Gen 1, you had Magnemite, which is literally just magnets. And then, oh, this one's all these magnets stuck together. 
You have Voltorb, which is a fucking Pokeball. Electrode is an upside-down Pokeball. Like, the, the inanimate object designs, I always hear this criticism, and it is so dumb. It is, that has been a thing since the original generation. I, I, whenever the, you always see the Game Freak, you know, Game Freak's phoned it in on the Pokemon designs. It's the one thing I think they've been consistently good with. Actually, the the fact that they slapped wheels on two of the fucking legendaries, or two of the legendaries and a regular Pokemon in the most recent game was kind of iffy, but other than that, they've been really good on. Love Pokemon. I've seen the majority of the movies, played almost every game, and even watched the anime when I was growing up. But the entire concept is now so oversaturated. And before I get absolutely bent over with a Wii remote inside of me by every Nintendo fanboy from here to Kingdom Come, I do want to point out Nintendo has been putting out some good new IP within the last couple of years that's generally well received. Astral Chain, Fitness Boxing, good job. I've never heard of Astral Chain, I'll shut that out. Uh, but there's absolutely no argument when it comes to saying that those games didn't receive a fraction of the budget or time as, say, the latest Zelda. But Zelda's going to sell better, so of course they wouldn't. And that's my fucking point. And it comes full circle to the beginning of this video. Rather than take the time and money to invest into something that could become the next Zelda, or Mario, or Pokemon, or God of War, or Elder Scrolls, they aren't willing to take that risk anymore. And that's one of the scariest parts about all these acquisitions to me. When it comes down to only a very few number of companies, they're all going to bank on their original IP rather than trying anything new. And by the time it comes down to your 23rd battle pass on Call of Duty Canada, you're going to realize we all got fucked. <laughs> so, what can we do? Well, first and foremost, stop pre-ordering games. Yes. It incentivizes these companies to continuously put out trash, and you're paying for something you haven't even seen or played before. Wait until it comes out or watch some early access gameplay. Read a couple reviews. Secondly... Try new games. Try smaller games in different categories you might have not have been a fan of before. Try some game by an indie developer you've never heard of. It might surprise you. Another great thing you can do. Honestly, one of the best things for me getting access to new games that I probably never would have tried otherwise is Humble Bundles. Like, I'm subscribed to hum Humble Monthly. You get, like, X amount of games a month. I, can't, I don't know exactly how many it is. I think it's 12. Um, and most of them I never play. I've got like a thousand games on Steam. I've maybe played 150. But a lot of them, I, I, you know, it's like, oh, what's this? Check the trailer out. Oh, that looks really cool. Download it. Play it for a couple hours. Yeah, this one's mid. Moved in the next one. Oh, that looks pretty cool. Download it. Play it for a couple hours. That's really good. And the next thing you know, it's one of my most played games on Steam. Like, that's how Unrailed is such a good game. That's how I found Unrailed. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of games that I've found that way is cut down on the cosmetics and bullshit you're buying that does nothing to add to the game. This doesn't mean that if you see a cool skin, you're not allowed to buy it. It just means stop pumping more money into the game than the game itself is worth. Because that's one of the major reasons these companies are starting to care more about cosmetics and loot passes, more so than the actual game or gameplay itself. If these companies care so much about our money, then spend it where it counts. As a final thought, I want to say that this whole video isn't supposed to be a rip on a specific game or company or capitalism in general. I'm just trying to point out what myself and a lot of other people have been noticing is happening to something we like a lot. And trying to use some facts and data to at least back it up. Of course, it's all subjective. And there are going to be plenty of people who don't agree with probably a lot of what I've said. I probably made fun of some of their favorite game series or studios. And that's okay made fun of Pokemon. because everyone has a different opinion, especially when it comes to a massive subject like this. What I really want more than anything is for whoever's watching this just to look at gaming. Where was it at 10 or 15 years ago versus where is it at now? What are the pros and cons that have come with the development? Oh, 809 was the peak. Years? And honestly, what can we as consumers do to make sure that it's going to be the best it possibly can be for us in the future? Ladies and gentlemen... I've been your host for the evening, and I hope you enjoyed it. Good night. You know, I, I agree with pretty much everything he says there. Um, the only thing I, I disagree with was the uh, the criticism of the Pokemon designs, because I, I that's like a common Gen 1-er type comment. And it's like, bro, 
the original first gen had inan inanimate objects as Pokemon designs as well. Everything else, though, I 100% agree with. I think a lot of these companies do rely on IP, and they use that IP to push out trash games uh, or to not innovate, especially the not innovating part. You know, every game is basically becoming an Assassin's Creed clone. Um, you know, it's a open world game that's still somehow very linear. Uh, that has like a bunch of like mini objectives that are all you know displayed on your map that you can go do, and yeah. Or the other ones that really annoy me are the walking simulator games that have become very popular, and I don't know how. And a bunch of them continuously win game of the year, and I don't get it. Uh, the like the Drake's Uncharted type games, they're super popular. People love them, and I do not get it. It's like playing a movie. It's like why don't I just watch the movie? Right? And you'll often hear people say, oh, it's just like playing a movie as a, a good thing. And it's like, that's like exactly the kind of thing I don't want in a video game. I don't want it to be like this super linear walking simulator. But those games have become so popular for the over the past decade or so, and I don't get it. But at, at least with those ones, they don't have microtransactions. Even if I think they're crap and overrated, they don't have microtransactions. But anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.